Well, good day to you, Redeemer Bible Church. My name is Curtis Field, and I am blessed again to be able to spend this time with you. We are going to be in Matthew 24 today, uh, verses 1 through 22. And we're really going to shift gears right now from what we've been in this, this time of some parables and Jesus talking to the re Jewish religious leaders and a lot of tension there. And now we're going to be privy to a very private moment that Jesus has with his disciples as he teaches them about end times. And so we're going to begin in chapter 24, and it continues into chapter 25, what is called the Olivet Discourse. And it's called that because Jesus is talking privately with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And so it is actually the fifth and the last of five discourses that are recorded in Matthew from Jesus. So as I said, in this discourse, Jesus teaches his disciples about future times and events. And we're going to see that there's both a near fulfillment of these and also a far fulfillment um, that as he talks. And that's often the case with prophecy throughout Scripture. So yesterday we saw the end of Jesus' public teaching ministry as he leaves the temple. And after having multiple conversations with the Jewish religious leaders, he leaves for the final time. And, and he says, uh, Scripture says, it is, or he says, it has left you desolate. And so really the glory of God and Ezekiel had left to the east. Jesus comes back from the east into Jerusalem. And now he is leaving. He's done. He's finished. They have totally rejected him, these leaders. And many of the Jews ultimately will as well. And so he leaves. As he's leaving, um, his disciples ask him, uh, or I shouldn't say ask him, but they, they acknowledge and point out the temple. So let's take a look at that. So in verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his temples, excuse me, when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all, uh, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So this would have blown the disciples' minds when he says this. Uh, because what he is predicting is the Romans destroying the temple and ultimately Jerusalem in 70 AD, which we've talked about over the last week. And this would have challenged them for a couple of reasons, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but ultimately, it provokes questions initially. So let's read that. So as he says this about the temple... Um, they begin to process and try to understand how that fits with their eschatology, so to speak, which is a study of the end times. So in verse 3, it says, And he sat on the Mount of Olives, or as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? So here's two questions that they have. Number one, when are these things going to happen? And number two, what will be the sign of Jesus' coming and the close of the age? Now, they're asking because they had a very different eschatology than Jesus. They, like many other Jews, thought that the Messiah was going to come to overthrow Rome, Roman occupation, and was going to become the literal king of the Jews. And uh, Luke 19.22 helps us to understand that they were um, believing that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So they didn't understand this idea of Jesus being uh, crucified, resurrecting, ascending into heaven, the church age, until Jesus came back one day. And so when Jesus talks about the temple being destroyed, they're looking for him to help them to kind of put all this together with what they think is going to happen. So we're going to look at um, verses 1 through 22, but right now we're going to zero in on 3 through 14. And I'm going to read the first part of that passage because Jesus is going to describe the general state of the world, certainly as it's been for a long time, but also the events that are going to take place leading up to his return. So let's take a look at these passages here. In verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him uh, privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will meet, lead many astray and you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Okay, so let's pause there for a minute. So he's giving us a list of things that are certainly true of the world, but that are, that are events and specific things that will get worse and worse and worse until he returns. And so let's start with when he talks about many will come and say, I am the Christ. That's certainly been true since Jesus, but that had even started during the intertestamental period, which is this 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Israel was waiting for, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come, longing for him. When was that going to be? And during this period, there were false Christs that came. But we've seen that since Jesus, of course, this has been true as well. And then he goes on, he talks about wars and rumors of wars. And, and he gives this really kind of a scary list, like, like epic list of conflict and strife and war and pain and difficulty and suffering. But what's important to understand is if you think about history, these things have been present for a long time. It's incredibly helpful that he uses this compar uh, comparison of childbirth because he says that these things are just the beginning of the birth pain. So when he was speaking to the disciples, he's describing these events, telling them it's the beginning of the birth pains. And when you think about uh, labor, at the beginning, yes, there are contractions and they're painful, but they're farther apart, not as painful, not as severe. And as labor progresses, as it goes on, the pain gets way worse and they get closer and closer and closer and closer together until the baby comes. And so he's using that analogy to help us understand how serious things are going to get uh, as they progressively get much worse and worse until he comes back for us one day. All right, let's go ahead and look at verse 9. He goes on to say, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So, this ends incredibly hopeful, and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but first, he goes on to describe what's going to take place. And he talks specifically about the suffering of the disciples and the followers of Christ. And so, the suffering, if you look historically throughout the church, the numbers of Christians that have been persecuted and, and martyred and, and murdered is is almost unimaginable. In fact, there are many countries around the earth right now where it is illegal to be a Christian. You can lose your life for being a Christian. The persecution is intense. People are meeting in private, in caves. Uh, and, and so this persecution has continued. However, what's interesting to note here is as things get worse, there are professing Christians who are going to fall away. And it says many will fall away and the love of many will grow cold. So this love for, for God that they profess is going to go cold. Which we know biblically means that they were never truly saved. There will also be false prophets both inside the church and outside the church. But Jesus makes it clear that genuine believers will persevere to the end. And so whether it's scriptures like, you know, Paul is saying they went out from us because they were never of us. When people have left the church and denied Christ, his point is they were never truly believers. That's why they left. Or if you think about genuine believers, there's so many verses that talk about how believers will persevere to the end, not because of our own strength. We're not holding on to God. God is holding on to us. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Romans 8.39 talks about um, that, well, I should say Romans 8, by the way, is one of the most hopeful chapters in all of Scripture. Romans 7, Paul is talking, and 6, really, he's talking about sin and the difficulty of it. And Romans 7 gets very personal for him. And he begins to talk about his own struggle with his own sin. And he finally cries out, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from the body of this death? 
And then he answers his own question, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And there is there, therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But, but chapter eight is one of the most hopeful, encouraging, comforting chapters in all of scripture. And in there, um, there's a long list of things that will not separate us from the love of Christ. And Paul's making the point, even in the midst of our sin and our struggle, we will never lose our salvation. And so there's this one line in Romans uh, 8.39, where Paul writes and says, nor anything else, so he's got this long list, all these things that won't separate us, and he says, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that means nothing in all of creation can separate us, and we are created, so we can't even separate ourselves from God. We, we can never make the decision, if we're a genuine believer, that we don't wanna be saved anymore because God is keeping us and he is preserving us, and that's good news. Okay, so... In verse 14, we have this verse that says, and, and the, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I wanted to read that again so that can be fresh in our mind because in spite of all of this difficulty, in spite of all of the obstacles, all of the pushback, all of the persecution, all of it, there's this amazing hope that because God is powerful and because he has a plan that will come to pass, that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed ultimately throughout the entire world. Amazing to consider. And we've certainly seen that come to pass when it starts with this little scared group of Jews who had put their faith and trust in Jesus and he has died and they're afraid and now it's a faith all over the world. Amazing. And so the end will come. So the great tribulation, tribulation will come and then ultimately Christ's return. All right, let's jump into verses 15 through 22. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. So this, this particular warning here, we see come to pass. Uh, pure, it, it appears in 67 A.D., where the, um, uh, there was a, a Jewish revolution, Jewish revolt, and the Christians actually fled to these mountains. But there's also a far fulfillment that we're going to look at as well because um, there's more that's going on. So there's a, a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. Same with the abomination of desolation that Daniel talks about, that Jesus references here. This originally referred to the desecration of the temple in the second century. And some have also put forth that this prophecy um, might have also been fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. Um, so there, there's this sort of original desecration that was a near fulfillment. But when you look in 2 Thessalonians and Revelations, you also see that it points to a far fulfillment when the Antichrist does this. And so things are gonna get so bad with this um, abomination of desolation that it's on a scale way bigger than any, like, you know, 70 AD or what happened in the second century BC, like any of that stuff. And we're going to see that. So let's read. 21 and 22 are key, and this is where we're going to end. For then there will be a great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And so Jesus here is making it clear. This is something that has never been seen nor will never be seen again. And so those, those other two events do not fulfill that. And so what we're talking about here is something that is so cataclysmic that it's a once in the history of the world event. And so we're going to see that come with the great tribulation, which Revelation talks about. And so as we think about this, we also see God's grace because it's going to be a terrible event. In verse 22, 
And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, these days have, those days have been cut short. So we see God's mercy here. The elect are Christians. That's how scripture refers to Christians, that God elected them to be saved. And for them, he cuts this tribulation short. So we see even his mercy and his grace in that as well. Um, so we're going to end there. We're going to pause there. We'll pick up again tomorrow with the following verse. Um, but I want to leave you with a couple of quick verses. One is 2 Thessalonians 4.18. Um, when, when the idea of the second coming of Christ is being talked about in that chapter, in 4.18, it says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We are to be mindful of the second coming of Christ. We are to be thinking about it. It gives us hope. We're to look forward to it. Titus 2.13 says, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. These things should spur us forward as we long for and we look forward to it. Okay, so great to be with you today. I will see you guys tomorrow. God bless.